Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another live stream. This is the Dungeon Master Lost Mon of Fandelva DM tutorial. Uh, we are continuing. We this is lesson two, and I will be covering covering uh, Craig Moore Hideout. Um, I have a lot of slides for you, but we will go back to the dice miniatures and um, battle mat at some point uh, when I start doing some demonstration. Um, Look, this is a new endeavour on my part. This is something that I'm trying out. It was designed for Lighthall. We'll see how well it works here and to see how uh, popular it is as well. Um, I'm hoping this will get more people playing the game and uh, I will start in a second. So make sure you are comfortable. Make sure you have some food, some drink and I will just pop out my headphones because sound seems to be working fine. You will find at times the sound will sort of change that is because I don't have a lapel microphone I am going to be moving my head around a lot it is also why you won't be seeing my head because frankly you, I would be looking down nerd guy 101 good morning yes it is it's actually 12 noon for me in New Zealand and hi Kathy Evans how's it going okay now feel free to ask questions I will come back to the live chat after the presentation for those of you who have many questions or have feedback feel free to do so okay we will get started shall we hi welcome to how to dnd my name is fred wheeler and today i'm going to talk about dungeons and dragons 5e specifically the topic for today is the lost mine of Fandalva. Uh, this is the last one of Fandalva, the Dungeon Master tutorial. This is lesson two, Cragmore Hideout. It is probably the first major dungeon or location that your adventure goes to, unless, of course, your players decide to go somewhere else, which can happen, but we will cover that uh, very, very shortly for those of you who are wondering, like, what could happen? Well, we're going to cover all of that. I'm going to try to fill out all of the gaps. The intention of this uh, tutorial is not to actually talk about the stuff that's already in the adventure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each location and section and there's some mis miscellaneous uh, recommendations. But the idea behind this is to give you all the stuff you would have to research and find. And that requires you to look through other books and to check other sources. And I have done all of that work for you. My endeavour is to make your life easier. Okay, so... The overview for today, we're going to talk about finding the uh, cave mouth and dealing with getting up to the cave mouth. We're going to deal with um, sneaking up on the, the goblin blind, because there's a, a goblin blind. We're going to handle the, the kenneled walls. We'll see how there's lots of ways it can be done. Uh, climbing the steep passage, we'll cover that. Uh, managing the overpass goblin spotter or sentry. The saving Sildar Hallwinter from the Goblin Den, which is basically the Goblin Eating Cave. Uh, running the Twin Pools Cave Trap. Uh, we'll also be going over, obviously, Clark, uh, the Climactic Cave Battle at the end. And there is a lot of miscellaneous recommendations, which of course, like anything that I do, you do not need to listen to. You can ignore all of that if you really want to, and I am fine with that. I can live that sort of thing. Now my objectives for today is to explain Cragmore Hideout, the encounters, um, how they can be run by a dungeon master. I'm also going to demonstrate, there's going to be some demonstration that takes place. I will kind of talk about role playing the monsters. I've kind of already done a lot of videos on that already, but we will do a little bit of that. Uh, running the, 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 the actual trap. I'm not necessarily going to demonstrate absolutely everything. It will be up to people part of this class to actually decide where we go. Now there was supposed to be a practical playthrough possible. I cannot do that on YouTube. This is only here anticipating YouTube gets their act together so we can do that because I can't necessarily do that at this present time. What I will say is, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, that the Lost Mine of Fandalva, the adventure, is now available for free on D&D Beyond as a result of Wizards of the Coast buying them up, which is fantastic. One of the things that has occurred that I frankly think has changed the playing field because now you have access to all of the high resolution maps which means you can take them and get them printed out on your printer or you can take them to a, a print shop and get them printed out there 
and wind up some very impressive looking maps. Not all of them can be printed to scale. <laughs> some of them can and some of them it's impractical. Uh, but you also get all of the images and you get all of the information on the adventure and you also get access to all of the stat blocks for the monster on D&D Beyond, including some of the more uh, specific ones, such as Mormus the Wraith and uh, Venom Fang is just a, a young green dragon, but there are a few others, I believe. The Ash Zombie, I think, is there as well, and the Red Brand Ruffians is also included, so you can actually access all of those sorts of things, and this is for a later date, but today we're covering Cragmore Hideout. Okay, Cragmore Hideout has a number of locations. As you can see from the map, there are eight locations listed on this map, and of course, we, we try to use each one as necessary in the right place, depending on what the players do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down each one and give you an idea of what is likely to happen, fill in some of the gaps that might have been left um, by the adventure, and then of course we will we'll open it up to uh, discussion at the end, but I will of course give you recommendations, as I have said, you do not need to listen to any of them. So starting off with the first uh, location, which is Area 1, uh, the Cave Mouth. It should not be difficult for the players to actually find the Cave Mouth. If we transition from the first lesson we ran, uh, and we follow the Goblin Trail, eventually this is where it leads. So it's actually not difficult to get us to Cragmore Hideout, or it shouldn't be. Uh, once we get to the Cave Mouth, the characters can sneak up on the cave mouth if they want to uh, with a stealth check. Uh, the DC I have worked out for you in advance is a DC 10. It is normally considered a contest. This is just another way of doing it. What I have simply done in this case is uh, to avoid being detected by the goblin sentries uh, that are in the goblin blind, which is area 2, uh, we're going to do what is called a, a group check. Now, you do not need to use group checks if you don't like them, I totally understand, but group checks basically require that half of the player characters must be successful. So if you have four players, that means that only two of them need to be six, six, six successful in their stealth check of DC 10, and if the other half, the other two, fail, then those who are more skilled pull up their scores, essentially. They compensate for their... Um, poor movement and their ability to sneak in a very loud and uh, unhelpful way. Now, uh, one of the things, now with the DC that I've set for DC 10, the passive perception for a goblin, for those of you who are unaware, is actually a 9. So in the past, what you would simply have done is you would have made a stealth check contested uh, with the the passive perception. Now the problem with a contest is you can't get equal to or greater than. Normally with most roles it's if you get equal to and greater than you succeed, okay? But with a stealth check you must get greater than. You can't just get equal to, which is why I set the DC at 10 rather than at 9. If the player characters don't sneak up on the cave mouth, uh, then the goblins will notice them before they reach the stream. It does state in the adventure that if you cry, try to cross the stream or step into the stream, that actually triggers the goblins, they notice you. So what happens if the player characters have a goblin prison from the, the goblin ambush? Well, that changes things a bit. Uh, the characters have a much better chance to establish what threats are coming up and where the goblins are and where those threats are. Now that's provided they have the forethought to interrogate the goblins and ask them, there's a cave mouth up here, what are we likely to find up here? Now all I think you need to do is threaten a goblin's life and they will spill their guts. But if you insist that there must be some sort of check taking place, by all means go for it. Now a perception check can be made once the characters are by the goblin blind and the stream. They don't, they can't cross the stream, they need to be by the stream, by the goblin blind, as close as possible without stepping into the stream to hear or see the goblins with a contest between the player characters perception check you can use passive perception if you want that's why it's there it is a it is a dungeon master tool so it's there for you if you want it and you can contest that perception check for the characters with the goblin stealth check if it's appropriate now why do i say if it's appropriate 
Well, the goblins aren't necessarily hiding. They're not actually doing a very good job. The adventure states as much that they're not actually paying attention and keeping a good lookout. So it is possible to sneak up on them without having total cover or um, being lightly obscured or even um, heavy um, obscurity. It's not, they, they can just step out into the open. They just need to be quiet enough not to draw attention. Now, if they're not spotting very well, they're probably not necessarily doing a particularly good job of trying to hide. Uh, if anything, they may in fact be chatting and talking amongst themselves, or they may be doing something else, which I will discuss in a second. But if you are going to be making a stealth check for the goblins, it is a plus six, and you add that to a d20 or uh, a 20-sided dice roll. Okay. Right, the next section which is the Goblin Blind, which is area two. Here we go. Uh, the Goblin Blind. Now, you might like to have the goblins playing cards in this area, or playing dice, or playing some sort of goblin game that you have created yourself. But I'm going to suggest that they are probably getting up to what goblins do, which is playing games. Okay? Uh, and any kind of game would be suitable, but I'm suggesting playing cards and dice. Now, even if the goblins uh, do notice the player characters coming up to the cave, they can and should um, yell out a warning. Um, the only problem with the goblins yelling out a warning from this location to anybody populating the cave is nobody in the cave is going to be able to hear them. Why? Because of the waterfall noise. The waterfall makes so much noise, it will actually cover up the noise of talking and movement. <clears throat> so you can pretty much be sure that no matter what you do on the outside of the cave, it's not the sound is just not going to travel inside. So uh, that means that at least one or both of the goblins will probably make a run for the cave to get help. Because two goblins against a party of adventurers is asking too much. So at least one of them should be going for a, for a run, if not both. So it's important that the players do actually try to sneak up on them. These goblins will not wait to wait around to just chat with the player characters. Usually, you're going to find that they are going to fear the leader's wrath more than they will fear what the um, the player's characters can do. So that means that having a chat and negotiating with them might be a bit more difficult. It doesn't eliminate it, but I think the first response the goblins are going to have is not to just wait and see. It is probably, they're supposed to be on guard, they're probably going to attack. And if you aren't a goblin or part of the Cragmore tribe, then you are the enemy. Um, this doesn't eliminate negotiation with them or bribing. It is an option for player characters. You just might need to uh, allow players to do that once the aggressive negotiations have started. If the player characters have a goblin prisoner, well that changes things a lot more. Negotiation should be much easier with the goblins and the blind. And you might like to actually grant advantage on any dice rolls that require a check when actually negotiating with the goblin blind um, uh, goblins, the sentries there. Particularly if they already have a Cragmore tribe goblin prisoner. <clears throat> Now, one of the things you'll discover, if your players are smart enough, and you may even want to let them know that this is possible, and that is that the sleep spell can easily take down all of these goblins without a fuss, and then you can just tie them up and gag them, and that's the end of this encounter. And there's nothing more to it. It just requires a simple spell of level one to shut them down, okay? What I'm going to also say is that there's a confusing section in here, um, and <laughs> um, I only just discovered it. I think somebody did point it out to me a long time ago, but I think I've only sort of, it only just sort of clicked yesterday, which is, as a result, I had to update all of my notes <laughs> um, because of this. So sneaking past the goblin sentries is really unlikely, and this is because of the gap in the thickets just at the, the entrance to the cave mouth. Um, and of course, it also requires you to step into the stream, which again, you would make noise. Now, you could, of course, try to jump over the stream, and there is a little bit of a, a dry area, a stone area that they can walk on, 
So maybe if the player characters jump across, but there's, there's just this great huge opening, which is about five foot wide, which is a hole in the, the thicket itself, which would probably be very easy for goblins to sort of notice somebody moving past. The, the thicket itself is supposed to offer a, it's anywhere from a plus two to a plus five cover bonus to your armor class if you're using the thicket as cover. Now that means a plus two is half cover, and a plus five is three quarters cover. Now why am I saying a plus two or plus five? Because the adventure is quite confusing on the cover bonus that is provided by the thickets. There is reference to half cover, and then there's reference to three quarters cover. And you're going to have to decide which one you think is appropriate. I personally think that a plus two bonus to armor class is more than sufficient, and that a plus five armor class or cover bonus is probably more suitable for something that isn't a thicket with holes in it and more say something like a proper arrow slit but you are the dungeon master you will make the decision about this not me i'm just thought i would point it out okay area three which is the uh, the kennel area this is where the wolves are this is um probably the first time you're going to encounter uh, player characters trying to have pets. Um, we'll get to that, don't worry. There are actually three wolves in the cave, but only two are visible because one of them is behind a rock. So when you describe things, you might only be describing that there are two wolves, yet the adventure lists that there are three wolves. Now a lot of people have in the past suggested that this was a um, an error that this was a, uh, a typo of some kind. It may well have been a typo. If you have an early version of the Lost Mine of Fandelva, um, that's, my, that's what you'll probably find. Um, if you have a newer version of the Lost Mine of Fandelva, well, there may have been a correction that took place. But I do remember there being a lot of arguments on the internet about this. The wolves can actually be ignored completely if they don't go into the kennels. If they don't go into Area 3, they don't even have to do anything with the wolves. Now, because... Wolves um, growling and barking and making noises is, again, not going to be heard because of that waterfall. And also, too, it's not uncommon for wolves to make noises, and uh, I'm sure the goblins are kind of used to hearing that sort of thing, even if they could hear them. Now, sneaking past the wolves is very unlikely. You don't need to actually sneak past them, but trying to sneak past wolves it's not practical because they have a strong sense of smell. They don't need to see you. They only need you only need to be in their, their area and they can pick you up because of their their special trait. That's that keen sense. Uh, now calming the wolves can be achieved by using soothing words and gestures. It does state that it's a DC 15 wisdom or animal handling check in the adventure. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that giving the wolves food, or rations, whatever you decide to distract them, which is a very good idea, um, has supposedly, you, you wind up with a DC 10 animal handling check. I'm gonna to say to you, ignore that DC 10 animal handling check. It's unnecessary, it's an easy thing to achieve. Why are you getting people to roll dice for something that's easy? We certainly wouldn't be getting them to do something that's very easy, which is a DC 5. DC 10 is a waste of your time. If they give out food or rations, they succeed in distracting the wolves, and that's it. Um, players, characters who want to take the wolves as pets will find this quite impractical, and I will explain, but there are some options here. Now, you need to have a lot of time to actually make a wolf a pet. And a wolf is a wild animal. Not only is it a wild animal, it is a hostile animal. But it could, you could allow something to actually occur here if you decide. Um, you could make a persuasion check or a charisma check. The player characters could make, say, a DC 20 um, persuasion or charisma check if you decide that is suitable and appropriate. If you're wondering where I got this number from, then you can turn to page 245 of the Dungeon Master Guide. And it talks about uh, the kind of the DCs you, you would use when dealing with various um, NPC interactions and your rolling dice. Now if you decide that rolling dice is not the way you want to go and you are looking for something else, you're looking for the players to do something very specific, here are a few things that they could do. 
They could befriend the the wolves. Probably the most obvious thing to try to do. Uh, now, how would you go about doing that? If you want to befriend more than one wolf or just one wolf, you're really going to need something that has some sort of special magic tied to it. So what sort of special magic are we talking about? Well, I'm talking about something like Animal Friendship, the spell, which you will find on page 212 of the Player's Handbook. You may find some players who try to use this spell to actually um, affect the, the wolves. And so play that out. That seems like a reasonable attempt, um, a reasonable approach. Now, if you have a player character playing a druid and they transform into a wolf, then why not allow them a better chance of affecting what the wolves do? Now, how that looks, again, is up to you. Or you could, uh, anybody who's playing like a ranger, and you, if you have a person who's actually willing to play a Beastmaster Ranger, the companion feature actually could play in here. This is a good opportunity for them to pick up that particular um, kind of animal. Now, bearing in mind that this supposedly kicks in at level 3 and they're supposed to be level 1, but if you're running this adventure at a higher level, or you're allowing players to have animal companions, then, then those wolves really sit there as a prime opportunity. But if you want a bit more information on the Beast May Master Ranger companion feature, just check page 93 of the Player's Handbook, and it does have some detail there. So all of these are potentially capable of achieving that desired result of befriending the wolves. Now the fissure in the rear of the kennels is the back door to Clark's cave, and it can be accessed, as the adventure states, with a DC 10 strength athletics check to scale the, the chimney shaft. Now normally with a, any kind of DC 10, I would normally ignore it. But the, the good thing about the DC 10 strength check in this case, and the only reason that I haven't dumped on it, is because failure should have some sort of consequence. Now, what does that mean? Failing and falling means injury, which is one aspect of a consequence. So I don't want that to be gone. It's very unlikely that it will occur uh, because... I mean, it is a D DC 10. It's not a particularly difficult. It's a 50-50 chance for most characters, if not even better chance to actually succeed. But it also means that there's potential for the wolf in Area 8, Clark's Cave, to hear them, or better, better, better yet, to smell them. Um, because, you know, brushing up against something, more likely to actually draw its attention. Um, or if they're trying to, if they manage to get past the wolves and they haven't killed the wolves and they're still in the kennel area, then those wolves may f wind up being riled up by the fact that somebody just fell down the, the chimney shaft. So that's the only reason I haven't um, eliminated the DC-10 uh, strength check or athletics check. Now I know a lot of dungeon masters say, well how many times do they need to make that check? And I'm going to say, rather than getting them to make multiple checks, uh, based on how much movement they might move. So if you're moving and climbing, it's half your speed. So if you have 30 feet, you'd only move 15 feet up the shaft. I would just get them to make one dice roll rather than making multiple dice rolls, okay? Again, it is just a DC 10. Now, even though the fissure is there, climbing the fissure is not necessarily the best action to take for the player characters because only one player character can climb to the top at a time and it also splits the party. That means whoever's at the top has to fight off a bugbear, a wolf, and two goblins while the others try to climb up the shaft. So it's not necessarily a particularly good strategy, unless of course you've got somebody who can tank for a very long time while the rest of the party make their way up. Okay, area four, which is the steep passage. Uh, this creates a few problems. There is a lot to track in this location. A lot of different things that wind up happening in this area. Uh, I think I may have done a mistake. If I did, I'm just checking it now. Okay, so transitioning through. Just make sure I do it right. Okay, so the, um, the steep passage. There's a lot to actually remember here because there's a lot going on. We're dealing with traps. We're dealing with light sources. We're dealing with a goblin sentry at the same time, all of which is going to complicate things uh, in um, a variety of different ways. 
So what we want to do with this location is we want to break it down into the things that are most important. I want you to start with dark vision, perception and light, and then move your way through the next step, okay? Which is probably going to be the, um, the effect of the century, and then we'll deal with the trap. So I'm breaking it down in that way, just to make it easier for you. All right, so there is no light source uh, in the cave at this point. So there was light flooding the opening of the cave mouth up to this point. So if characters don't have dark vision, they need to have a light source now to be able to see. One of the things that we have done in the past, if you're playing older versions of the game, and you may like to suggest this to newer players, is we do what, um, when you're guiding a blind person or someone who has no vision, uh, there is a particular way of doing that. They usually present their elbow and you stand behind them and you put your arm up against their elbow. And so if they stop, you stop. And when they move forward, you move. And so where they walk, you walk. And this is actually a good way of guiding somebody who can see um, when you're pairing them up with somebody who can't see. So there is actually a way of dealing with this that player characters might like to use. But again, a light source is probably much more appropriate. Now, player characters with a light source will give themselves away to the goblin on the bridge who is the sentry in Area 5, and that will happen automatically. The adventure does actually spell that out, for those of you who are unaware. Um, player characters can attempt to hide in darkness against a goblin with dark vision. I know a lot of people think, oh, you have to have heavy obscurity, but actually, no, you don't. If the PCs aren't being stealthy in the darkness, they will also be noticed. Um, you, you do need to and remember that sound is not going to give them away, but other things can. So even their scent can give them away. Maybe not so much to a goblin, because like humans, humans' uh, ability to find a smell is not so great. But if, um, if your player characters, characters have been messing around and gotten pretty dirty and have fallen on a few traps, they might smell a bit by now. Uh, so there are there are ways of going around uh, doing dealing with this. Now I know a lot of people get really confused about what's the deal with dark vision and darkness. The thing is that if you have dark vision and darkness, you can't actually see clearly. Okay, that means that things can be obscured from you. There's a reason why. Even if you are a goblin with dark vision or a player character with dark vision, you have disadvantage on perception checks. Okay, so if you're in a dark cave, you have disadvantage on perception checks. And that also goes for the goblin, and it also means passive perception, there's a minus five penalty. So there's a good chance that either the player characters can hide in the darkness and the goblin can do so as well. Okay. The player characters will not be given away by just talking because of the waterfall or making noise, but they can give them themselves away due to other reasons. Now, that's the waterfall in Area 7 that I've already talked about. This will keep coming up. If the player characters, no, if they, sorry, if the goblin notices the characters intruding, the best way to play the goblin sentry on the bridge is that they sneak away and signal for the flood trap to be released. This can be done twice, and my suggestion to you is that you have the goblin um, act as a runner. Rather than being a, a goblin that tries to fight, it's not actually a very smart idea at all. I will talk more about that in a second. Okay, this is also where the, the trap gets triggered, uh, and it, it can potentially affect everybody um, from that point. This is where it's going to come rolling down very, very quickly. Most of the characters who are wearing armor will weigh over 100 pounds. And the trap or the, um, the rubble will actually be triggered by being at least 100 pounds in weight. So when climbing that rubble or, or encampment, it is probably going to get triggered by every single character. Now, I would exclude any kind of small size character who is either a wizard, a sorcerer, or a monk. In other words, if you're dealing with a small small sized character and they don't carry martial weapons and they don't wear armor, it is it is it's much more likely that they will weigh under a hundred pounds. But if they're wearing armor and they are larger than than small size, it's probably not going to work. Okay, 
Um, that's probably the easiest way, rather than trying to calculate the weight of your player characters when they get here. That, that would be just torturous, so don't do that to yourself. Okay, area five. This is the overpass. This is where our goblin sentry is. So I'm going to go and go into a bit more detail on the goblin sentry. The goblin can be standing on or near the bridge, looking toward the cave mouth. That's probably the most sensible thing for this goblin to do. I don't think this goblin would be mucking around because they would be spotted by other goblins who are um, over in the, um, the Twin Pools cave. And there's also the problem of potentially Clark spotting that he's not doing his job well. But it's a bit different for goblins right, right in the front of the cave. The player's characters with dark, dark vision will, again, as I said, have disadvantage on perception checks to notice the hiding goblin on the bridge. And I would have the goblin on the bridge or near the bridge hiding. They can use the corner of the, the cave um, passageway on either side, but I have selected the one closest to the north. And the DC, well, the stealth modifier for the goblin, again, is a plus six. I would also ignore the instructions about having the goblin throwing javelins from the bridge. One goblin throwing javelins from a bridge is a stupid thing to do. And instead, and, I, and yes, goblins are stupid at times, but I don't think that's stupid. Um, instead, have the goblin, as I said, signal twice and retreat to the Twin Pools Cave area to back up those goblins. That goblin's job is to signal and it's time to activate the trap. It would make much more sense to have the goblin on the bridge acting as a runner, as I've, I've pointed out, and, um, and just inform everybody in the cave. I mean, once they've activated that trap, the runner can then cross the bridge again and go and tell everybody in the goblin den that there are intruders, and also inform Clark, if you like, particularly if the player characters are taking a bit of time. There's a good chance that the players will not get to the final location without Clark being aware of their presence. Okay, area six. This is the goblin den. Things get a bit complicated now. Uh, we're dealing with a lot. There's a lot of goblins in this location. Um, the goblin cave is actually brightly lit from the campfire, even with the smoky haze. It, the adventure talks about a smoky haze. But I had a good hard look at how much light is given off by a campfire. I tell you, it was hard to find. But I did. And you'll find the entire room is well lit. So you don't need to, um, there isn't a really a way of hiding in bright light unless we're dealing with something else. Now sneaking up to the eating cave can be achieved, but probably only from a particular distance. Your player characters are probably going to have to be about... 30 feet from the fireplace or from the, the campfire um, they can make a stealth check um, and also too I think something to bear in mind is these goblins are tending the fire so their attention may not be on anybody coming up from from that uh, that direction okay so it, it might well be possible to sneak up on them but just walking straight up into the room right up next to them is probably not going to be happening um, but there is a sort of a point uh, where your 30 foot sort of runs out and you can kind of potentially sneak past or sneak up to them. Um, and then at least attack them from the juncture point where the, the, the room or cave uh, meets the passageways. There's sort of like a three-way juncture point. Now, again, the sleep spell could put a lot of these goblins down in one turn. And if player characters have the sleep spell, I recommend that this is probably the best time to use it. Because a lot can go wrong in this cave. Uh, Yimmick is close or near enough to Sildar Hallwinter to get a blade to his throat in just one turn. And kill him as he only has one hit point. So there's a good chance that Yimmick could wind up... Um, killing Sildar before the player characters have very much time to do anything else. The leader, Yimmick, can be negotiated with to release the captive, Sildar Hallwinter, and the adventure spells all of this out, it's all there. Yimmick might try to uh, convince the player characters to defeat Clark and his leader. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Um, I would say that... Yimmick probably wants the player characters to do this in secret. He's not going to necessarily spill his guts to every other goblin in the cave. 
So when the negotiation takes place, there may be some interplay by Yimmick to try to convince the other goblins that he's not playing along with them and um, instead to get them closer so he can whisper what his real demands are and what the real deal is, which is ransom Sildar for the task to be completed, which is to kill Clark for him. Uh, Role-playing Sildar Hallwinter is listed on page 11 of the adventure, but you will also find an, a video on my um, channel that covers that character in depth. And if you want to role-play Yimmick, he is also uh, on page uh, 10 to 11 of the adventure, and you'll also find a video uh, on my channel on that uh, character as well. Um, what I would say with Sildar Hallwinter is there's plenty of information there. You play him straight. He's tired, he's injured, but you play him pretty straight. Yimmick... Yimmick is a sneaky bastard, okay? That's how you play that character. It's the easiest way to sort of run that character by you. Um, I don't think there's too much more to say about that. It is also very likely that Sildar Hallwinter will be killed by Yimmick because the goblin, goblin leader will probably betray um, any kind of deal that uh, is made with the characters. Now, I know a lot of people have a problem with this, and I think primarily the, the, the issue is, well, if the player characters can kill Clark. Why would the goblin leader try to take on a group of individuals capable of killing somebody that, that, that Yimmick can't? And that's actually quite a valid argument. I would also say that I think that if he does betray them, he's going to be doing it once they have been depleted and are injured straight after Clark has died. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to happen much. I think Yimmick is going to be keeping an eye on any kind of battle that they have with the leader, the, the, you know, the bugbear leader. If Sildar Hallwinter survives, he can travel and fight with the party. If healed, he doesn't necessarily have to be healed, but he can be healed. Uh, you could equip him with weapons and armor. I think probably the most sensible thing for Sildar to do is not to get up into melee because he will be badly injured and tired. And it's probably better that he simply picks up a goblin um, short bow and uses a short bow uh, in the back range, in the back um, back of the party. It's probably much more sensible. He can move out from cover, shoot, and move back, and it's uh, it's easy. I would um, hand over Sildar Hallwinter to one of the individuals in your party that you trust and think can be responsible to do so in a reasonable manner. Okay, so Area 7. Area 7 is the Twin Pools Cave. The Twin Pools Cave there's not an awful lot to say other than it. I would say it takes an action for a single goblin to release the dam. So it's not going to take very long. Six seconds for a goblin to do this is once they know. And they just need to get to the first uh, wall and knock it over. And that's an action. Potentially in this area you will find anywhere from three to four goblins will have set up some sort of ambush in the Twin Pools Cave with bows readied uh, for anyone who tries to move along the stream or cross the bridge. I think they would cover those two entry points into this location. Go the goblins in the cave can pull back to Clark's cave if the bugbear wants them to, or they decide it would be sensible to do so. That then reinforces their, um, their position. Uh, if you do this, it will make the, the final battle significantly more difficult. So if you do this... Maybe don't do it straight away. The player characters can negotiate, uh, sorry, the player characters probably can't negotiate or intimidate or even bribe the goblins in this area. Now why is that? Because Clark the bugbear is way too close. He's right next to them essentially in the cave, uh, right, right beside them. So they can't really get away with um, a negotiation with the player characters or um, being intimidated or are bribed because being intimidated just going to wind up with them being if things don't go well they can just call on the bugbear to help them that's that's the biggest problem and bribing them with money there's a good chance that the um, that Clark will notice this transaction so I don't think it's it's very sensible I think because they, um, the goblins are so close, they're going to be far more afraid of the bugbear than the player characters. Until, of course, they find out that they should have been afraid of the player characters. But that hasn't happened yet, has it? Okay, area 8. Area 8 is Clark's Cave. This is a location that, frankly, you are hoping everything is going to transition into some sort of wonderful final climactic battle 
and that's not necessarily going to be the case. I, f I find ultimately that lots of people are hoping that takes place, but it doesn't necessarily work that way. Instead, what you will find is when you get to this area and you try to play through it, a little bit of adjustment is going to be required. Okay, You will find ultimately that you're going to have to use your brain as a dungeon master. You're going to have to make a few things up, but I'm going to give you some basics here to help you. And that is role playing Clark is on page 12 of the adventure and there is a detailed video on my channel that talks about this. Clark will likely know the player characters are coming unless they have used the fissure. If they came through the kennel area and used the fissure, they probably will be able to surprise Clark coming through that location, provided they did a good job. There, there are exceptions, of course. Um, Clark the bugbear is unlikely to surrender. Bugbears aren't prone to surrendering no matter what. Uh, they always tend to think that they are the toughest and strongest individual in any kind of room. It doesn't matter what's going on. And violence is right up their alley. Um, but the goblins might actually surrender if the bugbear leader is defeated. So that might actually make things significantly easier if the player characters can take down the bugbear first. I would also consider having Clark use the two potions of healing in the battle. Now I know that is supposed to be treasure for the player characters once the battle is over, but it makes no sense to have potions of healing in this location and not have them on you. Why would Clark do that? So I would essentially allow him to use those two potions during the battle. If they're fast enough, they might still have one, or, uh, one of those potions left. They may, may even be able to finish them off fast enough to get both potions, but who knows. There are actually three main routes uh, to Clark, or the, um, the cave that Clark is in. There's the back door through the fissure. There's also going along the stream in the cave to the Twin Pools area. Or they can strike a bargain with Yemek in the Goblin Den, and then cross the bridge. Um, each one of these has a different benefit and different problems associated with them, but they aren't actually the only options. It is possible to travel up the main route along the stream and when you get to the bridge to actually throw say a grappling hook and a rope up onto the bridge and then climb up that rope onto the bridge and circ you know, circumvent uh, climbing up through the, the rubble, uh, dealing with the goblin den, you could get rid of all of that. You wouldn't have to worry about um, contending with the, the fissure. Um, you may even find that if you have very clever um, players that they have figured out a way of disguising some of them as goblins bringing prisoners back. Now that's going to probably require a player to have a disguise kit or maybe a prisoner that they can use as, look, here's one of the goblins and there's another goblin with them. Um, I don't know. I suppose this ventures into the, the realm of will the player characters decide to cover themselves in green paint dress if they're playing, say, a gnome or a halfling or a small-sized um, character, will they cover themselves in green paint, dress up in the clothes of the um, dead goblins, and then cut off the face of the goblin and try to stick it onto their own face? I mean, it's getting pretty um, gory at that point. Um, I don't think that you're going to have to deal with that if you're dealing with kids. Uh, <laughs> and then there's always the possibility that somebody will come up with a different solution. This is just some of the basics. The last thing that I want to say, and these are some of my recommendations for you, I have about seven things that I'm going to suggest to you that I think will help your game and make things a lot easier. And actually one of these, actually one of these ideas and recommendations I've only just added today. I don't know why I didn't add it earlier, but I, I just added it literally just before I started this lesson. Uh, resting in the Cragmore hideout is not practical for player characters. Um, if they haven't cleared out this area, it's just not going to work. They need to move a good distance away from the cave. Uh, they can't just camp out in the cave. Because what is going to happen is there's going to be a goblin who will move around and spot them. And they'll disrupt their short rest or long rest. Um, I know that uh, it doesn't say anything in the adventure about these goblins moving from one place to another. But it is impractical and silly that no goblins move around and there's no patrolling goblins. So short rests and long rests in this location, not practical. They need to move away from the cave. Uh, the treasure on page 12 can be expanded if you want to. But it already it's already pretty extensive. So I don't think you need to 
but you can if you want to. Don't forget the Lion Shield Costa supplies. Those supplies can be lo loaded potentially onto the wagon that already has the mining supplies on it and the party would be ready to go and they can take that back and get a reward for it. Um, now I know uh, there might be some of you as dungeon masters who feel like they need to come back with a second wagon to load up everything for the Lion Shield Costa and then bring it back to Fandlin. If you feel that needs to be done then fine. I think it's perfectly reasonable to simply move those supplies onto the existing wagon. Uh, non-player characters uh, or party members that wind up with a non-player character in them try to make sure that you select the most responsible and capable player to run Sildar Hallwinter as a non-player character in the party if you wind up with one or if you're dealing with say a, um, a wolf that winds up being part of the party uh, now if you're dealing with completely new players that might be more difficult so you'll have to use your discernment uh, with the group that you have um, I think it's probably best not to load this onto your own workload. As a dungeon master, you have enough to do, so reduce your own workload. Don't add to it. Give the job to somebody else. What if the goblins know? Um, what the goblins know, um, if questioned or interrogated, is listed on page eight of the adventure. I'm not going to go into too much detail with this, but I think the other thing you need to consider is that. Any goblin that they capture and interrogate in any location can reveal additional information about the cave location, um, cave location itself. So the hideout itself, they can reveal like where people are, what's going on, so that the players have a better idea of what's, what to expect as they proceed. So um, absolutely reward players for having the forethought to capture goblins rather than kill them and then interrogate them or question them. Now, remember, if the player characters rescue Sildar Hallwinter and are su successful, and they and they actually agree to escort him back to Fandolin, that they get an extra 500 gold pieces for the entire group. That's not 500 gold pieces each, that's for the entire group. It's still worth it, so yeah, just don't forget that. I know a lot of people often forget that, even though it's stated in the adventure. Now, once the Cragmore hideout has been cleared out of goblins, once all the goblins are gone, if they are all gone, they might not be, uh, what can you do with this location? Well, this actually makes a pretty good home for a wild animal. If you wanted to put a wild animal in here later on and they ever come back, they might find that something has moved in. Or the Cragmore goblins might reclaim it. There are more um, goblins in the Cragmore tribe, so they may find that there's a whole lot of dead individuals here and simply re repopulate it. You could also allow the players to use this as a home base. This is like a secret home base for them now. You know, when they want to sort of hide out from whatever or anybody, this is where they can come. Or, and this might be useful for those of you who are thinking of using the Ruins of Thunder Tree and the Dragon Inn, this location, once all the goblins are gone, probably makes a better home for a green dragon, Venom Fang, than something like the tower over at the Ruins of Thunder Tree. The Ruins of Thunder Tree is, is not a very good location for a green dragon, but the great thing about this area, this Cragmore hideout, is one, there's a stream, there's water, there's a waterfall, and there's potential to block off the water coming through the waterfall into a pool, and that pool can be used by the green um, young green dragon to hide in, to put the, its treasure in, and to sleep in, because they can breathe water. And, and I think you'll find that Area 7 probably makes the best major area or location or cave location for a dragon, rather than any of the other areas in this cave. Okay, all the other cave um, sections are probably better left for something else. Now, goblin, um, so dragons as a general rule, will allow things that they think are beneficial to them to live in their cave space. Uh, but they probably won't be necessarily goblins. Maybe kobolds move in. Who knows? It's up to you. You, you figure it out. Uh, make sure to award your experience points. If you're using experience points, the adventure states 275 for each player character. Uh, if they complete this area and you're not using experience points, you're using milestones, then give the player character a new level. They, they level up, this is the completion of this area, is a milestone, they level up. Um, 
Now remember, you don't have to kill everything in a location. You can drive it off. You can make them flee. Uh, you can convince them to do them to, to side with you. So awarding milestones and awarding experience points is not dependent on killing absolutely everything in the cave com complex. For anybody who is kind of curious, <laughs> I know that is often the go-to is like if you don't kill it, you don't get it. But that's not necessarily the case at all. Okay. I'm hoping this was useful to you. If it was, fantastic. Now, I want to know in the comments sections, I want to know in the comments, what are your questions? What is your feedback? Was this helpful to you? Was it not? It is designed primarily for beginner dungeon masters rather than experienced dungeon masters. And it is also designed to try and fill in the gaps where you may have to nut a few things out. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Oh, man, I almost lost my voice. Okay, transition over. We will go through the chat. Um, I'm going to need to drink some water before I go through the chat. Okay, so. Um, oh my gosh, there's a lot of people here. Um, I just want to remind people that the Alexander Johnson, thank you for the super chat. I really do appreciate it. Uh, my daughter and girlfriend have created their characters and we're doing a session zero tonight. Awesome. What does a typical session zero look like? Okay. If they're building their own characters, then get them to build the characters together. That would be my first advice to you. My next piece of advice to you is try to explain some of what's going to take place so they can build a character for your campaign and for the adventure itself. You don't want to give too much away, but you can you can give them some some information to help them with that process. I kind of did talk a lot about what you need to do in session zero in the first lesson, um, Alexander. So that means making sure that they they are friends with Gundren Rockseeker, that they have established why they are friends, um, that they have connections with each other. Um, I'm sure that your daughter and your girlfriend can figure out why they are together doing this in the first place. Uh, those, those are really important things to consider. And uh, if you have those sort of buttoned up and they are invested in supporting and looking after Gundren, then the most of it will follow pretty easily. Um, and also too, there's an element usually in session zero of just, just talking about stuff, like just getting together and hanging out. Okay, so before anybody sort of um, runs off, one of the, and really do thank you for the Super Chat, Alexander, one of the important things for this class is your support. Like Super Chat and Super Stickers, really important. They really do make a big difference to ensure that these classes continue. Um, one of the, uh, my prefer preference is that you use Patreon rather than Super Chat and Super Stickers. Now the reason being is that you get additional content off Patreon. You can, you only have to pay like a dollar a month and you get everything because there's no tiers uh, on my Patreon. Uh, but you also get all of the Dungeon Master handouts for the classes that I run here. So all of my live streams have notes, including this particular lesson. So all of those notes will be put into a document that will get updated over time. It won't stay the same. It will be turned into a PDF and it will be uploaded in a couple of days uh, to Patreon for those of you who don't want to try and take notes or just want to have all of that there available to them. And I'm sure for those of you who know how to unlock a PDF, you'll figure out how to add your own stuff in there as well. Um, so yes, uh, I said hi to Nerd Guy. 101, good evening, uh, Pale Rider, um, I'm just here to annoy Fred, that's that's fine Pale Rider, you you, uh, you are here to do that, That's I, I, I know, I know, um, hi Scott, uh, Mike Hall, how's it going, um, Jasper, hello Jasper, I'm surprised, I know there's a lot of people here who have actually run this adventure before, so if you have advice for people in the chat, please do share it, um, Often when you get the view of just one person, I will do some demonstration, by the way, with maps, miniatures and dice. I will do be rolling and I'll be showing you the, ma the maths for a few of these 
different aspects of the um, the game in this location, particularly for those of you who are completely new to the game or, or is feeling feeling like you're not confident enough to do this. For those of you who are more experienced, that won't be very useful to you. But let me go for the chat first. Um, so part of session zero is getting to know players. Yeah, you kind of already done that and covered because you're dealing with a girlfriend and a, a daughter. So that's that's. But um, I can assure you that your daughter and your girlfriend, uh, there's no such thing as too much time having a chat. <laughs> they don't mind. They really won't. Um, but yeah, if you're not making characters, then it's just about sort of laying out the foundations for why they're connected and uh, why they're friends with Gundren Rockseeker. Yep, we also, yes, often we do talk about uh, what are sort of the options? What what are we going to allow in our game? What we aren't going to allow in our game? Session zeros can look very different depending on what you do. I have a video on session zero which is very extensive. It kind of covers everything under the sun. Um, there are lots of videos that sort of do talk about session zero, uh, frankly. But the, the key things are the ones that I've just spoken about. Uh, what do you got here, Pale Rider? Uh, yeah, so there's another, another, there is another aspect to this, as Pale Rider is pointing out, is trying to figure out if the adventure you're about to run is what they are interested in. Because if you start running it and they're just not interested, that would be a waste of your time. Um, so it's always a good idea to give them a basic idea of what they're likely to get into. You don't have to give away spoilers, but you can you can explain that, you know, um, there's some caves, there's a castle, um, I, you can say there's a mine, because it's a lost mine of Fandalva, there's a mine. Um, there might be dragons you come across, um, there's going to be a variety of different creatures and monsters and a bit of negotiation and, you know, so, you know, I think, I think a, a basic idea around Gundren will help, but give them a, an idea of what they're getting into. Um, is it Palibo? Palibo, Palibo A. Um, so, yeah, so what you're talking about is if your goblins use their um, short bows and they're not, you can't use a shield if you're using a, a short bow. So you'd have to take the shield off, right? Uh, which is actually an action to do so. But if they're set up to do that sort of thing, um, whoever just gave me the twenty dollars super chat, I I really do appreciate it. Okay, uh, <laughs> you've 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 essentially made a huge difference. What I'm going to say is, you're right. Um, the armor class of a goblin is usually fifteen, and so when you when you have your armor class for your goblin, which I'm going to write down here now, goblin armor class. So it's normally a fifteen. But if you get rid of the shield bonus, which is a 2, it goes down to a 13. But if you're using the thickets as cover, then it would go back up to 15. Because 13 plus the armor class of 2 for the thickets becomes a 15. The only problem is, even with that, you consider what would happen if we get rid of that plus 2 bonus and we put in a plus 5 bonus. Because we just if you decide to, it's going to be three quarters cover, what do you get? You get an eighteen. An eighteen for a level one character is pretty hard to hit. It makes it significantly harder. But the great thing about the sleep spell is it covers a big area, and you don't have to worry about armor class. It just works. In fact, I will show you very shortly how the sleep spell works right here today. Um, I just want to acknowledge the person who gave me the super chat. Oh my gosh, it's all the way, Alexandra. It's you again. I super appreciate this lesson. Um, I'm nervous about the combat being slow and confusing. Ah, is that just how it, it is at first? Yes. So first off, do not put pressure on yourself running your first combat. Okay? It is all right for it to be slow and cumbersome. Uh, nowadays, my group, we've been playing for a long time with 5th edition, and we played before that, and we can get through uh, a, a combat in five minutes. Sometimes even faster. Okay, and that's using maps, miniatures, and dice. Maybe not this layout, but um, <laughs> we, we can do it. And that's because we don't use 
uh, initiative in the same way that it is taught in the book. Um, and I, I can cover that at some point. If that is what you want, without super chatting me, Alexander, you've given me more than enough money, okay? Um, as I said, you're, you're all much, it'd be much smarter to simply sign up to Patreon for a dollar a month and just download all the DM handouts because uh, there's a lot coming. So to give you an idea, I think what I will do is I'm going to roll some stealth checks for a group. I'm going to show you what that looks like. And then I'm going to go through and I'll, I'll do some initiative. Um, I've done this before in these classes. I'm happy to do so. Um, but what I would like to do first is just make sure I cover as many of the actual questions that were in the chat. And I think I got up to, yes, I did. Uh, okay, Mike, what have you got here? <laughs> you wouldn't want a, a pet wolf raised by goblins? Yeah, they may not be, yeah, they wouldn't require a lot of emotional support. They may be quite damaged. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to agree, Mike. Absolutely. Good point, Michael. Oh, what do you got here, Scott? Ah, so so Scott is using, um, for the scent aspect, is using the AJ Pickett uh, random wind direction dice. So AJ Pickett will be very happy. He loves talking about those dice. So I think they're very clever. They're actually very much the idea is based off the old RP, based off the old RPG dice, which you could get, but they don't sell them now, and they were always hard to get in the first place. Um, and so he he convinced he convinced a dice company to make them. And um, I think this is one product that he may have actually made some money on, rather than unfortunately the big pockets battle mat which cost him a fortune in, in uh, freight because of the pandemic uh, right rescue dogs yeah yeah so look how much r realism you put into the game is after you it really is so you know the amount of realism that you want to impart into your game is up to you it does help players if they feel like the world that they currently interact with is very much like the fantasy world and the only difference is there is it's like a med medieval setting and there's magic and there's monsters because um, it gives them makes it easier for them to make decisions do you know what I mean and vision yeah well it's gone unfortunately okay so question from Mike in the last session uh, you suggested that if the party are defeated by the goblin, goblin arrows ambush yes they could wake up as a prisoner in the hideout. How would you run this scenario? Okay. Sure. You can do that. Well, I would say first off, they won't have any gear. Right? Their gear is gone, Mike. As we expect. Their gear and packs might be in the same room or they might be, say, over here. Over in this location. But you can then place your tied up and gagged uh, NPCs in the cave along with Sildar Hallwinter. They would basically wake up alongside him. Um, this also means that potentially he might be resting right beside them uh, when they wake up. This makes it, I think, far more interesting. Now, what you've got to do with allowing, you know, allowing players the opportunity to escape from being a captive is you have to present opportunities when they can do that. Um, it, is, it is no good if the goblins always are looking at them so they can never try to break their bonds or cut free or, um, you know, there, there's lots of different things. I would say you just present it as they wake up and you find yourself in a cave next to what you recognize as Sildar Hallwinter, but he's got no armor on and he looks badly beaten and he looks exhausted. Um, so that's probably the easiest way. Does that answer your question, Mike? You'll let me know if I, d I didn't do a good job. Okay, um, so I've got to do some demonstration very shortly, but Cole, you got a, what do you got here? So Cole, you have a party that are using all the pre-generated characters. That's, that's fine. Steamrolling all of the enemies. Yes, they, it does happen. Um, how many, so Cole, it's, it's good to know 
how many player characters do you have in the party? If you have seven, that would not surprise me. So how many do you have? And the other thing I would say is how experienced are they? Because if they are experienced players, I would not run the adventure the way I've just described. Um, and I would be far more ruthless. I am with my own group. They are, they are much more experienced. They could handle this with their eyes closed. And they could do stupid things and they'd still get through perfectly fine. Um, and also, what options, Cole, are you allowing in the game? Um, so three questions. How many players have you got? How experienced are they? And what options have you made available? So if you answer that question, I can come back to that. Uh, NJ, so NJC Morph, how's it going? You have only two players? Um, no, no. Uh, so it is possible to get through this location with just two players. I'm about to show you this very thing. So with two players, I would recommend giving them an animal companion. You don't have to give them these wolves. You can give them something else. That then beefs up the number of individuals involved. It's always risky with just two players because if one goes down, the other has to either get the other one up or try to continue the fight. And if you aren't able to continue fighting and defending yourself and you're in the middle of trying to assist somebody else, there's a good chance you will have a TPK. This is why when my group um, falls below three players, I don't run the game. Or I run them with sidekicks, animal companions, hirelings, or henchmen, or hench people. Okay? Um, yeah, where rats could absolutely, Mike. They could move back. They could move into Cragmore Hideout and call it something else. Um, Kathy Evans, you found this helpful? Awesome. That's great. I'm so happy. Good news. Um, nay, nay. You you found it helpful too? Good. Air B. Um, you, look, you do not need to have Dungeon Master controlled NPCs. You can simply give them, as I said, an animal companion or something su super simple like a, um, a sidekick. Kids, women, and even new players will be quite happy to have an animal companion. It's, it's very much in line with the concept of the modern fantasy nowadays anyway. It just doesn't work if you have five or six player characters and everybody has an animal companion. That, that's not a good idea because that's just too hard to manage. Uh... Is it A. Menzo? Thank you. I, look, if I got your name wrong, you will help me out with that, eh? Mazu. Mazu, I think it is. Um, you Look, if you, f you missed the first half of the stream, it doesn't matter. I, I, I've told you, everybody before, I will not be hiding streams anymore. I am not li listening to any more experts who tell me that it's a bad idea, okay? Uh, they are wrong. I, I can assure you that the channel makes more money off live stream and it makes more money off um, edited live stream than it has ever made on edited videos where I've spent hours saying the same thing 18 times and then spending hours cutting it all together in the editing room. Um, so they will not be hidden. You can still find them. Uh, so Jeff, hi, how's it going? So you just finished session one last week. Your video definitely helped me. Good, Jeff. I'm really ha I'm happy to hear that. Thank you for letting me know, Jeff Rocks. Um, you have a PC controlling the NPC, but the DM rolls for the NPC, and maybe even withholds the stat block of the NPC. I mean, you can do it that way if you want to. Uh, finding the channel and these lessons in particular was like a miracle for me. Okay. I have been what reading the books for weeks, oh dear. And I learned more from these videos. Well, that's the whole point in the first place. Mike Hall, you are welcome. Obviously, my answer was useful to you. I don't know if it really was, but okay. Um, so here's, here's the thing. What we need to do is we need to go over how does like the stealth process work. Our characters are probably going to be, I mean, it would be whatever distance away that they're going to be, right? But this, the moving up to the cave. And this is where... You don't need to get them to roll a stealth check in unless you're absolutely ready to actually determine whether it's going to work or not. But I think, and, it, and I would advise new players to do this, you know, they're like a, uh, a SEAL team, a stealth covert black ops team. That's how you play Dungeons and Dragons. And if you don't, you die. Leroy Jenkins um, lives again, okay? 
So let's consider what does that look like. So I'm going to move some of this stuff away or out of the way so that you can see what I'm doing in terms of the numbers. And I will put this here. Or should I move that to there? I think I'll move that to there and I can transition what I'm doing on my little whiteboard. Uh, let me know if I get in the way while I'm doing this and I will make sure to get out of the way. So let's start off with, I'm going to just use four characters. So we're going to go wizard. This is for a stealth. Uh, for stealth checks. Okay, and remember our stealth check DC is only a 10. So they have to get a 10 to be successful. So a fighter, a rogue, and a cleric. Okay. Did I lose something along the way? I think I might have. Oh, there it is. I've lost. I lost Gundren's little tag. I'll put Gundren over here because he's not with us today. <laughs> he's not supposed to be with us today. So our first character has a modifier for the wizard. This is stealth. You'll find that in the section just underneath the saving throws. It says skills. Okay, and the stealth for that character is a plus two. So two. And then we're dealing with, actually, do I want to do it that way? I don't, because that's going to be confusing. I'll do it on the whiteboard and transition over. So the wizard, two, plus whatever you roll on a 20-sided dice. You get your players to do this. They do this for their character. You don't have to do that. Okay, and I get an 18. So 18. And 18 and 2 is 20. So the wizard, their stealth is a 20. So they succeed. Okay. Our next character, which will be, we'll just cross that out, is going to be the, the rogue. We'll do the rogue. Uh, so their stealth modifier is much higher. On the uh, sheet, it is a 7. So then we roll a 20-sided dice. I rolled a 3, so it didn't do so well. doesn't matter. So you've got a 10. 10 is still a success. Remember, we only need to get a 10. So Rogue has got 10. Remember, we're treating this like a group check. Only half of the checks matter. Okay? Not all of them. Uh, that's not that one. And then we're moving on to the Cleric, which is a minus 1. It's not great. <laughs> and it's also at disadvantage because we're wearing heavy armor. So we take two dice, so minus one, and we'll roll our dice. When we roll these dice, we're taking the lowest result. I might just move these guys a little bit further over. I don't know if that's necessarily close enough to where you can see what's everything going. You'll let me know if I need to move it over more. So two dice, take the lowest result. I got a 20, I got an eight, so I take the eight. I do, I just pull it off the end of there. There we go, eight. So minus one is seven. So that is the cleric, is only a seven. And then our fighter. A fighter is a, oh, which one, which fighter am I supposed to be looking at? Great sword, longbow. No, I think that's the wrong one. There's another one, there's two fighters, and I think I'm using the one with the great axe in this case. So that is a plus two for that one, I believe. No, it's a plus two. It is a minus one as well. Okay, so that'll make it easy. I just need to roll, rub out the section here. So the fighter is also disadvantage, heavy armor. Two dice. I rolled two fives. Well, gosh. Five. Minus one. Four. Four's not good. So the fighter failed. So this is what it looks like. Group check, stealth. Moving up to there. Trying to avoid being noticed by the goblins. Okay. Cleric. Failed. Fighter, failed. Wizard, succeeded. And Rogue, succeeded. Because they needed a DSM, needed a 10. So that means that the Wizard and the Rogue support the poor stealth of the Fighter and the Cleric. And the group as a whole succeeds in avoiding being noticed. That's how group checks work in Dungeons & Dragons 5e. If you're using group checks. And I recommend that you do. I think... The older system where one person uh, was responsible for everybody failing is not necessarily the best way to go. But that's that your choice, frankly. In the end, you decide if that's the way you want to do things. Okay, so now let's cross all this out. 
And let's look at what initiative looks like. So I think one of the things I want to do is I want to do initiative, but actually what I want to do is I want to show you how um, the sleep spell works. It is very possible that your wizard could just stand by the, um, the stream and then just cast on those, you know, see, seeing through the thicket, noticing these goblins there, okay, I'm going to cast sleep on them. As long as I can have a line of sight to them, even if there is some obs um, something obscuring it, like bushes and branches, as long as I can see them, I can cast the sleep spell. And the great thing about the sleep spell, and I'm going to show you it a couple of times in a different, different locations, so it's obvious to you, sometimes it's the best choice. So the sleep spell. How does this look? Well, we roll five eight-sided dice. That's it. That's all we do. There's no attack roll. There's no saving throw. That's all we do is we just roll those dice. So I have these dice prepared this time. Make sure I actually have eight, uh, five eight-sided dice. Now that's only for casting the spell at level one. If you cast it at a higher level, which they won't be able to do at level one, then it does even more. So let's have a look and see what that does. So there's five dice. So let's add that all up, shall we? So I've got a three. I've got a four. This is why I recommend that people use sleep. And then another four. And then a five. And that comes to a grand total of... Uh, 14, 18... 23. 23. You would normally get a pretty good number, and that's a fairly good number. Okay. So how does this spell work? Well, you cast it on a specific area, and when you cast it on a specific area, um, what it's going to do is it's going to put to, um, put to sleep that, um, that many hit points worth of creatures. So a goblin has very few hit points. This is why it's really good to use on kobolds and, uh, and, and goblins, and not so much on a creature that has a lot of hit points. The reason is because they only have seven hit points. So how many goblins can I put to sleep? Quite a few, actually. So if I take away seven, so seven, well, I've still got quite a bit left. And then another seven, that's two, that's only 14. Only 14 hit points, and they're both asleep. Just like that. That's how good sleep is. This is why I recommend that people get their players to use that spell. Okay? If I kept going, I could put together, um, with that score of 23, I can put to sleep uh, a total of three goblins, because they each have seven hit points, so three, three plus seven comes to 21. I've got two more hit points left, but I can't do anything with what's left over, so only three, three goblins total can be put to sleep. This is why it's such a great spell. Now, let's take a really bad location like the goblin den here, and we apply the same sort of principle. Okay, again, I could roll these dice, but I won't. It means that if they are here, and they can see the goblins, and they haven't been spotted, or you enter into a battle, that potentially your wizard, or whoever has the sleep spell, can put to sleep three of those goblins. So half the goblins are now out of commission. Now, they can be that you can wake up goblins, but the reality is that if the rest of the party does their job fast enough, and takes down or occupies the rest of the goblins quickly enough, you can deal with the situation fairly quickly. What does that mean? That means is that if you have a wizard in your party and you have a very small group, that you can probably deal with this location and that location pretty easily. Now because you only get a few spells at level 1, and you need to, if as, as a wizard, to actually uh, regain... Um, um, spell slots, you know, it, it requires um, arcane recovery and you need to take a short rest. They may only be able to do this once. But but clearly, either here or here is a really good time. Even doing it over here might be a good, good opportunity. Applying it to this situation, Area 8, is not such a great idea. You have got to be kidding me. YouTube, you, you have to get this sorted out. This is just ridiculous. Every time 
I have a live stream now, this thing comes up. I can report it. I can. Re I can try to block them. I can try to delete them, and it just does not stop them. Their their service on um, live streams, man, that is frustrating. Okay, so sleep, really good spell. This is why I say, um, say use it when you get the opportunity, players. And if you're a dungeon master, advise them on this. Okay, it's a good strategy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what uh, what happens if a combat occurs. And we're not dealing with surprise. Just straight combat, right? And rolling initiative. Rolling initiative is pretty easy. Usually your initiative score is your dexterity modifier. Um, so if the monster does not have initiative written on the stat block and none of them do, you're always looking at the initiative modifier, okay? So for me, as a DM, dealing with the goblins, their modifier, so I'm going to get rid of that. And we'll get rid of these dice. Because we're going to roll some 20 side dice instead. Let's get that over here. Only one. So initiative. Initiative. There we go. All right. So goblins. Dex, mod Dex modifier is a plus two. So we're going to add two to whatever we roll on a 20 sided dice. So I've got an 18 comes to 20 so that's the initiative for the goblins pretty high and we're going to do this for all of the characters as well so we'll get rid of that and we'll do uh which one is it so the cleric has got a modifier of minus one um which is pretty low so minus one and with, once you have all these numbers, you're going to put them into a descending order. So I've got a 1 on my check, which means I get a 0. That's not uh, something you often see, getting a 0 on an initiative. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. So that's our cleric. Our wizard has a plus 2. So that would be 2 plus whatever I roll on a dice. 20 which is pretty good, so that's 22, um, that's the wizard, 22, you can do all of this on paper, you do not need to use whiteboard markers or anything like that, um, it is absolutely not necessary, I am simply doing that because I'm trying to teach a class and uh, I think that's probably the easiest way to deal with it, the fighter is a minus one, should have done the fighter at the same time. So that's going to be a 13. So 14 minus 1 is 13. So that's the fighter. And then we remove that. And we deal with, uh, I believe it's the rogue is next, which is a plus 3. It's a 3 plus whatever we roll. We're almost done here. 16. So that's 19. That's our total. So 3 plus 16 is 19. Okay, so now that we've got our numbers, you can see them here. We're going to place them into order. The highest number at the top. So the wizard stays at the top, followed by the dungeon master, because the wizard had 22, the dungeon master's got to 20, so I'll put the dungeon master up here. Followed by the 19, which is for the rogue, so the rogue's already in the right place. Uh, followed by the fighter, and the cleric is coming in at zero, so they're right down the bottom. Okay, and so all you do is go through the order from the top to the bottom so that means the wizard takes their turn when they're finished then the dungeon master takes their turn when they're finished and you finish doing whatever you're doing with your goblins then it's the rogue's turn then it's the fighter and then it's the cleric and then when you get to the bottom of the initiative you move on to the next round and you go back up to the top okay now if you're dealing with surprise any creature that is surprised in other words is unaware that are of the enemy being there and that's what the stealth check and the perception check contest is all about. If you determine that there are people who are unaware of each other, okay, then during the first round, they don't get to do anything. They don't get to move. They don't need, get to make a bonus action or an action. Uh, they, they can't use an interaction. They can't do anything. 
They can't even take a reaction. But they do get their reaction back when their turn finishes. At the end of their turn, it does return. It does come back. You can use the reaction after that. But you have to wait until your turn is completely finished. <clears throat> that means on future turns, you could potentially use a spell or an ability that is a reaction, provided you've already had your turn. So that allows wizards to use the shield spell. You know, so if if the shield spell is required because the wizard's taken their turn and they were surprised and the dungeon master makes an attack and they wind up with a, uh, something trying to hit them and it almost hits them or is going to hit them, then they can use the shield spell as a reaction. Um, and the same sort of thing applies. As long as you, you've finished your turn, you can get your reaction back if you're surprised. Uh, but you have to wait until your turn is complete. So that's sort of how that works. The only time that combat really gets confusing is when we're dealing with surprise. Any other time you'll find it's actually not that difficult to manage. <clears throat> I just need some water. <clears throat> so I'm going to rub this out. And I guess um, there is a a little bit of a problem for the bugbear. Now the bugbear works really well if it gets surprised on its enemy. And one of the things you should also have done, this I brought this up in the, the first lesson, is make sure you have the passive perception for all of your characters. If you're using passive perception and it, it applies and you think it does apply in this situation, make sure you have recorded that in advance. Okay? <clears throat> but a bugbear based on its abilities and what it can do is set up to be an ambush monster so the worst thing that could possibly happen for your group is for the bugbear clark to be aware that they are coming because now you potentially can set up an ambush for them which means that the the brute ability that they have that melee um, weapon attack that deals extra damage is going to be really painful it's already included in the attack you don't have to add it Okay, it's just part of the attack. That's why when it attacks with a Morning Star, it does an extra um, a dice worth of damage. Instead of a D8, you get two D8. That's already tied in there. But on top of that, it has the surprise attack ability, which means that if it has, if it surprises a creature, okay, in the first round of combat, it um it does an extra amount of damage. That means you get an extra seven points of damage on that attack which is pretty significant when you're dealing with level 1 characters. It is possible that just 7 points might be very close to what a wizard has in total hit points when you're playing at level 1. So it is potential potential for this encounter to be fairly difficult and nasty. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you'll necessarily kill anybody, but you think about that particular attack and how that works. I'm going to show you what Clark's attack, just one attack, he doesn't have multi-attack, we'll use the Morning Star because that does the most amount of damage, <clears throat> and I want to show you what it's likely to happen. Now the, the modifier is pretty low, it's only a plus four to hit for the bugbear. So let's just have a look at the bugbear's damage though. Bugbear, attack. Now when you are surprising somebody, unless you can't see them, because it's possible to have surprise and for them to see you, um, if you are unseen you get advantage. That means you get to roll two dice and take the highest result. But if you can see them <clears throat> and you're surprising somebody, uh, then you don't. And usually if you're dealing with melee, you're probably not going to get advantage because they can see you. Even if you get to act first and you surprise them, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so the easiest way to look at this is roll one dice, add your four, that's your attack. There is probably less than a 50% chance that it will strike the target because most characters have at least a, a 14 armor class. Even the wizard is probably running around with an armor class of roughly about 14 or 15. The rogue's got a 14. And the wizard is probably, if you, you should have put your mage armor on, or they should have put their mage armor on, so their armor class should be sitting at about a 15. Okay, 14 or 15. So there's a 50% chance 
or less, um, or less that the bugbear will hit. But it's when it comes to damage. So let's have a look at what the damage output on their first attack is likely to look like. Uh, there's one d8, two d8. Okay, and it, let's say it's surprise. So we're adding two because that's the strength modifier. We're adding seven because of that surprise attack ability. And then we're going to add these two dice that we roll here to see what else we get. This is why bugbears are a big deal. Okay, I, I rolled pretty bad. That's probably below average. Four on each dice is roughly what we'll be looking at. So I still rolled pretty low. A two and a five. Okay, so let's add that up. So we add that up. That's two, seven, nine, eleven, sixteen. 16 points of damage, one strike from the bugbear if they hit their target. How many hit points do our low level, first level characters have? Well, as it happens, the rogue only has nine hit points. That means the rogue is not dead, but they're not standing up anymore. Okay, it wasn't enough damage to instantly kill them. You would have to have done 18 points of damage to kill them outright. But you can see the problem here with that particular feature is it is possible to take out a character in the first round with a, a bugbear. <clears throat> okay, let's look at the fighter. The fighter's well, well, relatively um, safe. They've got 12 hit points. Not dead, only down, but still on zero hit points. That's one strike from the bugbear. If I look at the other fighter, it's exactly the same. Still got 12 hit points. If I look at the wizard, the wizard has eight hit points, which is actually quite high for a wizard. Frankly, they've got a good constitution modifier. So here's the thing. What's the deal with, um, with our, our damage, right? If you have eight hit points and you take 16 points of damage, you have to take, um, basically, you have to be reduced below zero by your maximum hit points. So if I do... Um, 8, multiply that by 2, 16. If I do 16 points of um, damage to the, the wizard, the wizard is dead on the first blow. That's pretty bad. So every single character hit by this bugbear is either going down or is dead. Um, and let's look at the cleric. The cleric has 11 hit points. The cleric goes down in one blow during one round, but they're not dead and they'll be making death-dying saves. So you can see why this encounter... And that's not just the bugbear there. You've got a wolf and two goblins and potentially other allies joining the battle. So this is one location that's really bad. And I think you might find that a few characters will go down and have to be pulled back up uh, either with healing magic or stabilized uh, to ensure that they don't wind up dying. Um, but it's not going to, it's the, the battle's not going to unwind with no casualties whatsoever. Um, you're going to have some casualties. And the last thing that you want is for the wizard, or even the rogue in this case, because they've got quite low hit points, um, quite, quite, quite few, few hit points, that they are most likely to die. Uh, particularly if they wind up up close in melee. So something to bear in mind. Um... I'm not saying that you should change this encounter. I don't think that there is anything wrong with having death in Dungeons and Dragons. It's just how you decide to deal with it after. Okay? Because characters can will die here. And the sleep spell probably won't um, solve your problems completely. Um, but yeah, just, just consider that as a, as a warning. <laughs> you can now see just the, the problem. Now, if it did not have surprise that changes things again there's a much greater chance that you won't have to worry about that problem um, characters will go down but they probably won't die i did roll quite low on those eight sided dice i am inclined to suggest to dungeon masters you'll notice on the monster stat block for these these creatures is that they they have what is called average damage and the average damage that the bugbear does is 11 points of damage. So you don't roll any damage dice, and you just take the 11, and that's what you do. So that, that eliminates, flattens the maths out of it, and it means you don't have to worry about those um, rather peculiar uh, big leaps where potentially somebody could wind up getting um, critted. What if you get a critical hit, 
and then you wind up doubling all the dice. But instead of rolling two of these, you're rolling four. That's really bad news. That'll probably kill the fighter, okay, who has the most hit points. Um, so, yeah, just things to bear in mind is like, just <laughs> just think about that. Um, just a quick, quick look at the poll here. 59 people have voted in the poll. Uh, and I said, are you a first-time dungeon master running the Lost Mine of Fandelva? 39% said yes, which is interesting. I'm glad to hear that there's so many people who are. And then there were 19 people who said they're coming back into DMing. So you may maybe you feel that you, you're not quite up to par. Um, you're dealing with a new system more than likely. Okay, good to know. And actually, I'm again surprised that there are 42% who are not first-time Dungeon Masters running the Lost Mine of Fandelva. Um, so you have done this before. And look, if this has been useful to you, that's great. If it hasn't, don't worry, there are other classes coming that won't be revolving around the Lost Mine of Fandelva. We have some stuff for the more intermediate. Um, there's intermediate classes coming and there are uh, experienced classes coming that aren't revolving around fairly basic stuff, which I've kind of covered here today. I think we can um, finish up there. There are no more questions. Everybody's got kind of quiet. Um, I, I don't know that I necessarily need to demonstrate absolutely everything. Um, I mean, I can demonstrate a, an attack with a goblin. For those of you, there are two options, right? You have your scimitar, your short bow. I will put that down now. It is very simple. My suggestion to do is get your players to roll their damage dice and their attack roll at the same time. It's very frustrating for anybody when somebody doesn't do that. Um, the reality is that it takes time to get through everybody's turn and if you're rolling one dice at a time, it, it sucks. It really does. Uh, so goblin attack. Whether you're using, it doesn't matter if you're using the, the scimitar or the short bow, the maths for it is exactly the same, which is great, right? So we're dealing with a plus four to hit. So that's the 20 sided dice. Thank you, Phil. Uh, so four plus 17, 21. You're, you'll probably find that 21 is more than sufficient to hit any of the um, characters uh, that you're playing with here. I don't think anybody's gonna have an arm class good enough to deal with that. Okay, so that's gonna definitely hit. So that's our hit. Now, when we roll our damage, we're going to be rolling, it's a six-sided dice plus two because they're, we're not using their strength modifier. <clears throat> um, we're using their dex modifier. For a bow, you use dexterity when you add on damage. And um, if you're dealing with a scimitar, the scimitar is actually a finesse weapon, which means you get to decide whether you use your dexterity modifier or your strength modifier. It's a very unusual weapon. It's, it's it's capable of doing a lot more. That's why it's called a finesse weapon. Okay, there is another one called the short um, short sword. It is also a finesse weapon. So you roll six side of dice. I rolled a two, so two plus two. Okay, so when your goblins hit your characters, they'll do four points of damage. Now, four points of damage is actually quite low for what I just rolled here. The average damage is five, and I suggest that you use the average damage for the goblin rather than rolling dice. As I, as I said before, flatten out the maths, make sure that you don't wind up with those criticals. Um, well, not so much, we can't do much about the criticals. The criticals, they happen, right? What we can do, though, is we can we can flatten out the maths with the, the dice rolling, because on a six side of dice, you can roll anything from a one to a six. It's not a big deal if, they roll, if you roll a one, a two, or a three, but it is a big deal if you roll a six, and then you're adding a plus two, because that's eight points of damage. And as we've already discovered, First level characters, that's pretty much all their hit points gone. They can only really take another hit before they go down. Okay? All right. Okay, I think we've covered this to death. I see no more questions. People seem to be happy with what I have said. I will um, make it clear now. Uh, I will be back. Uh, this class, um, through the generous support of people on Patreon, but um, Alexander has um, really made it quite clear that I should keep going. And um, I recommend that those of you who need the notes on Patreon, then go get them. Um, I will be back next week at the same time. We will be covering Fandlin. And Fandlin's a different kettle of fish. 
Uh, Fandolin is one of those locations which usually confuses people and they wind up trying to do too much too quickly. And so I'm going to break that down for you and then of course answer any questions that you have. And yes, we will be going through the Red Brand Ruffian showdown. There will be a battle uh, that takes place. So I will have a battle mats and some miniatures and so forth ready to go to show you sort of how that works. Okay, and we are done. So thank you to my patrons. Thank you for all the super chats. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been watching my stuff. I do appreciate it. I'm amazed that uh, it is working out as well as it has. I honestly thought I would not go very well, but it's been going really well. Um, and thank you very much. So wherever you are in the world, whether it be the morning, the afternoon, the night, or the wee wee or early morning, please look after yourself, your family, and your friends. Hey, be nice to your neighbours, and till next time, keep rolling those 20s.